Welcome to the Let's Talk podcast, inspired by Mesquite ISD's Leadership and Empowerment Team, or LED for short. Our guests include educators, students, and community members sharing their experiences from their perspectives. So let's have a real conversation about embracing our differences and finding common ground with your hosts, Dr. LaDonna Gulley and Ted Madden. Thanks for joining us on the Let's Talk podcast. We are introducing a new segment today, Lessons with LaDonna, in which we'll have a brief conversation about a topic of her choosing. Along with that, we'll do our Let's Ask a Question, and we encourage you to email us with your questions at letstalk at mesquiteisd.org. We'll do those two things after our conversation with a pair of doctors today. I'm Ted Madden. I produce videos for the school district, and I'm a 47-year-old white man. I'm Dr. LaDonna Gully. I'm the Director of Leadership and Empowerment, and I am a 51-year-old woman, African-American woman, by the way. (laughs) And hello, I am Dr. Valerie Nelson. I'm the Director of the Learning Center, our district's DAEP, and I am a 50-year-old African-American woman. She's got you, or you got her. Well, she got here first. She just got the playground ready for me. What's D-E-A-P? I'm the... I'm the acronym police around here, okay? okay I love it. You Everybody know, we, who's been in the school district forever knows all these acronyms, and I don't. I am over the, I'm the director of the district's alternative education placement, which is for our, our disciplinary infractions. All right. Well, let's talk about your story first, okay. where you came from and how you got here. Ooh, that's a, ooh, okay. Well, I came to Mesquite in 1995 um, after being proposed to by my husband, or well, my boyfriend at the time. And um, I am a graduate from Grambling State University, grew up in a family of educators. Um, and so um, when he asked me to uh, marry him, he was here in the police uh, academy for Dallas. And so I said, well, you know, I'll marry you if you find me a job. And uh, he did that. And so um, I've had the pleasure of opening Tyson, uh, Thompson Elementary with Dr. Karen Nix, and she was wild at the time. As a first grade teacher, she actually hired me on a Saturday. And um, from that interview, I got an offer on an apartment all in one weekend. So I guess it was destiny. I've been here ever since. Wow. <laughs> and you've been there from, you know, being a teacher to yes, the I've steps. Ser- yes, I've served as a first grade teacher, a third grade teacher at Thompson Elementary. I became an AP in 2000, and I was split between Shands Elementary and Austin Elementary my first year. Um, and so I was an AP for four years here in the district. And then I was blessed to have my first principalship at Mary Moss Elementary. Well, I served there for four years. Then um, I took on a, a different challenge, being an early childhood major, went to middle school, and where I was the principal of Wilkinson Middle School for four years. And um, prior to becoming the director of the Learning Center, I was at Tysinger Elementary for seven. So I've been an administrator for a long time in the district, and I have enjoyed every minute of it. You have and just have really served, I think, our community as well as our students well. Take us back, though, um, to your AP times. As an assistant principal, that's always such a major jump. Talk to me a little bit about that because I want to say that you probably had some challenges, you know, in that role. uh, It was definitely an eye-opening experience coming from a uh, classroom teacher perspective. You know, your view is narrow. um, You're focused on your kids. You're focused on your grade level. And, of course, your goals for your school. When you become an AP, you now have this a little larger perspective. And I was split between two campuses, and I had two different cultures to learn, and I had a two-year-old at the house at the time and so um, it was it was a difficult challenge but it was a rewarding one and I got to learn so much quickly and so um, but also during my first year we had a a, a difficult situation develop um, to where I got to experience some of that raw racial tension that can happen with public servants and so we were in the middle of picket signs and being talked about on the local radio station, and it it really was a hard um, time, and it divided a lot of people. But I learned a lot of lessons in empathy. I learned a lot of uh, lessons in um, perspectives of how to um, listen to both sides and try to find that common ground that we all want for our kids. And um, Dr. Terry, I think it was his first uh, year as superintendent, and just to watch his leadership and the way he uh, navigated us through that and supported 
us and knowing it was my first uh, years of uh, AP. And I think at the time, Donna Gallagher was my principal at the time. And it was just a lot of lessons learned quickly and a lot of emotions to work through. Mm-hmm. You're pretty vague about the details. Is that deliberate? Can you What can you tell us about the incident? I probably think it would be wise to keep it that way. But there were some uh, things said that were racially charged at the school. And um, it, it, it did enrage parents and community members. And it um, it really got to be a tough spot to be in for a little while, for about three months or so. Mm-hmm. And even as just an AP and also being a uh, being African-American, you know, I'm sure that that role really kind of pushed you differently. It did. It put me in a spot where parents that were wonderful and loved me before that incident took sides. And having to learn how to still navigate and lead and still be what the students needed me to be during that time while learning the job um, was a challenge. But I wouldn't trade it for the world because it helped me grow Mm -hmm. and it helped me um, to deal with other situations that would arise later on um, when there were conflicts, either be between parents and teachers, students and students, students and teachers, um, community members and their perspectives about things the district they may not have understood or agreed with. So um, it it wasn't all negative, but it was a scary time. You know, I remember not going to church for a while because some of my uh, school uh, parents were church members mm-hmm. and being in a position where you can't talk about something that's in the middle of an investigation and um, people assuming because of your silence you can't speak on it, so you must be taking sides. And so I got called everything from a sellout to Uncle Tom, um, you know, um, but not understanding until after it was settled and able to have some conversations that I, I did what was best for the students at the time, and I left the emotions out of it. Mm-hmm. And I think it strengthened relationships with those parents, and I still stay in touch with some of them to this day. They understood it wasn't personal with me, but it did take on a life of its own, and it did create a position to where I had to be very mindful of my words, my presence and 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 the impact that I have in the district. Mm-hmm. Can you briefly explain to the layman, which is me, mm-hmm. what is the learning center? Okay, so the learning center is our alternative education placement. So students are assigned to me when certain disciplinary infractions are com- uh, committed on campus that requires them to be removed uh, from that home campus. Now, some placements can be discretionary, some can be mandatory. Um, and so um, I'm the, the, I guess, ISS or suspension on, uh, on steroids. Uh, I, but while they're there, instead of just focusing on a more punitive approach to things, we work on the whole child. We work on the social emotional pieces that may be interfering and causing students to self-medicate or uh, make decisions that they're making. Um, some of them come with situations and offenses that occurred off campus that also require them to be removed from their home campus and serve a placement with us. And those placements can range from 15 days to 180 days. There are some Title V state offenses that require you to be removed from campus in a calendar school year. So while they're there, we work on the academics, but Chapter 37 also dictates that we work on that behavioral piece. And so they set goals with us. They set academic and behavioral goals. We try to work as partners with the home campus to keep a connection between. And so our program is designed for them not to feel like they've been isolated or banished from their home campus, Mm -hmm. but that they recognize that they've committed offense. There's a punishment that has been attached to it, but we're not punitive in our measures. We are trying to um, best serve and prepare them to return to their campus and be successful while they're there. Do you mm -hmm. you find it to be more of a restorative approach? Very much so. Restorative and informative in in, in multiple levels. Um, Oftentimes when students make mistakes, they think everyone knows it. And so they're being judged and everyone is going to react to them that way. But we made it, I made it a point when I got there that their folders were kept away and closed up and locked up. And the only people that needed to know were the people that needed to know, which was myself, um, my registrar, who's putting their classes together, them and their parents. If they choose to share why they're there, that is their right to do so. But I, I didn't want them to feel like every day they were having to explain themselves. Every day somebody was wanting to judge them. And my staff has been amazing um, at accepting that 
you can service and 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 provide the love that a student needs and the direction they need without knowing the mistakes they've made. And um, and and it's been a very rewarding opportunity that I've been given. I'm not quite sure how to ask this. I know that's that's difficult work. It is because comes a lot of kids are not receptive. And so I guess what I'm asking is, is there a percentage you go for? Like if we can reach 50 percent of these kids, or if we can get 80 percent of these kids to kind of respond, then we're then we're doing our job because they're not all going to respond. They don't. But I go in with the mindset that if I meet you and I have enough time with you, I can develop a relationship with you. So I'm going for 100 percent, you know, and if that 100 percent is, um, Ted, that when they get back to their home campus and they're faced with a difficult situation, and they think to reach out back to me or one of my staff members because they've made a a connection with us and we are building that relationship, Mm -hmm. they feel like they can talk to us, that's a win. You know, we can't fix and change every decision that's made or the outcomes that come with it, but we can definitely lay the foundation for some pieces for them to improve and grow in, and that's that's what I'm banking on. I'm banking on that we're making deposits into their lives through the work we're doing, that they see that they can make a mistake and they can bounce back. They can hit the reset button and start over. Mm -hmm. Every day is a new opportunity. Students will continue to make mistakes. Um, I I wish that I can work myself out of a job. (laughs) You know, if if we can um, look at the reformative and and, and restorative practices um, in a way that we restructure our discipline, we restructure our um, code of conduct because it, it, there are some things that will require certain actions, but there are some pieces along the way that we can do that can help students hit the reset button and uh, and approach. Now, for those students that have those, um, oh, I guess, needs that require maybe some medical or other levels of support that we don't have, then we try to work with the parents when they do their part to get them involved in outside counseling or outside resources. And we build it into their program while they're here with us at the DAEP. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. And so talk to me a little bit though, about just the types of students that you get, because I think that people are always really interested when they hear learning center, they hear DAEP, you know, they're thinking, okay, well, this student obviously did a terrible thing, which is fine. Maybe Mm -hmm. they did, but Talk to me about your students and what are you learning about them as you as they come in and out of your center? Oh, I, I I'm, thank you for that question, because I think one of the biggest pieces of the culture uh, we decided as a faculty that we wanted to work on was changing the perception of the learning center, that the learning center was not a place where teachers were sent that weren't good in the classroom or they didn't want to be at a traditional campus because they didn't want to deal with star and scores or that every student that comes to that door is a criminal in the making and that they are going nowhere in life. Uh, No. I have students from straight A, all APGT classes, all the way down sometimes to kindergartners who are just now learning their letters. we have a variety of students, and those students come in um, with their heads down, sometimes embarrassed, sometimes angry, thinking they're justified. Either way, we take them where they are. We talk to them through our interview process. We have a, we've been blessed this year to get an um, intervention counselor as well as a behavior specialist added to the staff. I didn't have that last year when I started. And so I was all of those things. Dr. Johnson and I were wearing many hats, but we made it work because it was the love and passion that we had for the kids to be successful once they left us that was driving us. But now that we have those extra resources, what we're finding is that students that have um, come over for drug-related charges or infractions, they now get that intervention piece directly responding to drug usage and um, the possible habits and outcomes of those. Mm -hmm. Some of the students do have situations where they have probation officers. They may have ankle monitors. They may have to um, go in and have outside counseling three times a week. Whatever the judge's statements have been or whatever the, um, the decisions are, we support. And so we have a wide range. So that idea that it's the bad school and that's where only the bad kids go I meet parents every day that love their kids and want their kids to not be labeled, not to be defined by the mistake that they made, but recognizing you made this choice. These are the consequences. But how can we learn? How can we grow? How can we get better from this? What do you learn? A lot of our kids didn't know when they got Title V felonies on them that it 
um, takes them out of contention for certain jobs in the future or some federal aid, some other different things. So what we're trying to do is inform them so that if this was truly a first-time mistake, that we can work past it and you're young enough to, be, you know, to, to get over it and move beyond it. Um, but some of them, you know, they are of the age where some of it sticks. And so we try to find different ways to encourage them to look at other options that will be available for them so that they can see themselves with a brighter future. I'm curious what your general thoughts are on discipline for students, because there can sometimes be a racial component if it's a if the teacher is one thing and the students another. You're you're right. Um, a lot of my research that I did recently at um, SMU was on the disproportionality in disciplinary placements and how it was um, overwhelmingly impacting students of color. Uh, I recently learned at a um, conference. Um, not to use the word minority, because not minority sometimes um, insinuates someone is less than. And so we use, I think it's BIPOC. I think I learned from Dr. Gully's presentation with her and Dr. Glover, uh, Glover was that it's called um, black indigenous people of color, if that's what, if I, if I got it correct. Mm -hmm. And so what I feel is that there is a disconnect and the disconnect is is, is multi multiple facets. Um, you not only do you have the cultural disconnect of maybe there being teachers not as familiar with cultural differences and being able to respond appropriately to those cultural differences. Like when we greet each other, we may be a little loud. It doesn't mean we're about to fight. You know, so you don't have to overreact and rush in that you know thinking you need to break up something. Or um, also just the way we choose to discipline. You can have three people commit the same offense and get different um, consequences. And and you, you don't want to read into it on the surface level. Maybe this student has three or four referrals already in the bucket, and this is just the next progression. But when you look at the data and the discipline um, data across the state and across the United States, African Americans are um, disciplined three to five times more than their peers, their white peers. And so our, our our data tends to mirror that here in, in, in the district and in the state. And so our district has been very conscious of it and working towards trying to make some conscious changes. And I believe that some of that work is with the LET Committee looking at equity, looking at how are we doing discipline, how are we uh, looking at uh, these infractions and how are we responding? You know, does it really take 45 days off a of campus, which can equate to about two to two and a half months to deal with a fight, to deal with a, a student that came to school under the influence. Um, so there's still work to be done. I'm excited about the possibilities of where it's going. But my beliefs about discipline is that there's a lot of room and work left out there to be done. Um, because what we're seeing is that when you're using third and fourth grade discipline data across the states to determine how many jails to build, that school to prison pipeline is a real thing. And we have to disrupt that. And we have to, and that starts in the classroom with the teacher, building those relationships, as well as with our administrators in the schools deciding what their culture is going to be around discipline. Are we going to be punitive in nature or are we going to be restorative in nature? And you're, you've heard a lot about restorative circles and restorative practices. And yes, it did um, originate in prison because you, you you know, that's where it started, but there are some foundational pieces of it that can apply um, in all facets of society. You know, if some harm has been done from me to you, then there should be a piece of an opportunity for us to have an opportunity to piece back the relationship, the parts that have been broken. And that's done by us having conversation, us having dialogue. And part of the things that we've been working on at the Learning Center uh, is that not only when we work on the behaviors of the student, they're at-risk coordinators, they're counselors, they're APs that come over and visit weekly. They're also bridging the, the, and mending the relationship of the students so that when they return back to their campus, if there was an altercation with the teacher, if there was an altercation with an administrator or an SRO, that there's an opportunity for there to be some dialogue to mend that relationship. And so um, I'm, I'm really excited about the direction we're going, but there's still a lot of work to be done. 
There is a lot of work to be done. And so what are some things that you think are some next steps for us, not only as, as a district, but when we talk about our teachers and we talk about our administrators, what are some things that we need that you think coming from where your perspective is and where your lens is, where do you think we need to go now? Well, I think next steps in professional development is really looking at um, what do people indicatively believe about discipline and what should the role of discipline be? Um, Do they feel that the um, present policies and practices we have in place really match the behaviors that we're seeing? So I think some equity work needs to be done. I think there's some type of um, audit of, of each campus's data. What is your data really saying? Because you may only have 50 referrals, and you may have had 350 the year before. You will celebrate that as you should. But if of that 50, 35 are African-American males for your whole campus, then what does that say? Now, that could be misleading. I understand that because it could be one student with seven referrals each or, you know, three or four students um, with seven referrals each. But when... The data does still speak to a picture and a practice. What are we looking for? Do we assume that because students are gathered in the hallway talking loudly, a fight is about to start and we are already raising our voices and saying, da, 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 get back to class, you know, or already assuming the worst? You know, I think there is a subjective part to discipline that has to be addressed. I think there's a implicit, those implicit and explicit biases that help us decide what we're going to do when we're getting ready to discipline need to be addressed and to see how they're impacting our decisions. You know, there could be some things we're doing subconsciously that we're not even aware of that's harming our kids. But we have to get to a point where we're okay with being honest and saying, wow, I didn't know this is what our data was showing. And so um, I think those are two big next steps. I think there needs to be some type of equity audit where each campus is looking at their data not only by numbers, but look at it by categories. You know, who are you seeing in the office and what are you seeing them for? And when you have similar situations, are you giving the more punitive measures to your students of color and giving a counselor pass to your students that aren't students of color? And so it may not be conscious, but if you don't know, if you never look, you'll never know. So I think those are some huge next steps. And then after that work is done at the campus level, needs to be done at the district level. And then looking at where do we need to revamp our code of conduct? Where do we need to uh, strengthen our PD support for our um, APs and, and campus administrators? I know I've, I've found myself um, dispelling myths and beliefs about what it is we actually do at the DAEP quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's brought to my attention that there is a need for more information about what is it we actually do um, I think there are some that perceive, perceive that we have extra resources and uh, programs availability that the home campus doesn't have, which is not necessarily the case. And so, but we just take what we have, and I have some great people on my staff and on my leadership team that just makes this work so rewarding. But there is a need for information. There is a need for information sharing. And there's also a need for more of the campuses to come over and visit. Come see what it is we do. Come find out what it is we actually offer so that when you are faced with making a discretionary decision, is that the right setting? Is that the right place? It might be. It might not be. But if you never get out to come and visit, if you only go by what's printed in the code of conduct as your reference, then um, sometimes the punishment doesn't always fit the crime. Mm -hmm. We've got a few minutes for our couple last segments, starting with let's ask a question. Yes. You're welcome to uh, submit a question at our email address, let's talk at mesquiteisd.org. What do we have this week, LaDonna? So we had a question about uh, from a grandparent that really said, in essence, I do not want my grandchildren to be exposed to woke training. And so um, my answer to that was and is um, we are not that is not what we're doing <laughs> in Mesquite ISD. And that's the short answer. We're not doing that. To be honest with you, what we're doing is really looking at dignity very closely. Um, I listened to something the other day and it says, you know, respect is earned. Right. That we all earn respect. Dignity, though, is inherent. And it's inherent simply because of the fact that we're human. 
And when we look at people from a dignity lens, we begin to really change Mm -hmm. our perceptions about what we think and what we feel about people, no matter who they are, no matter what they look like. And so um, we actually, as a district, really took a strong look at, you know, what framework would we really look at? You know, everyone wants dignity. We did. We automatically it's inherent. We deserve that. And so what does that really take? And so we decided to use the dignity framework. um, And I am really excited about that framework because I think it touches on everything that we're about here in Mesquite. When we talk about cultivating culture, Uh, we're all about listening and having a high level of openness um, and empathy and patience. We're all about making sure that we are validating people and that we appreciate them. We are all about accepting and and making sure that everyone is treated fairly. Even as you listen to um, Dr. Nelson this morning, um, just because you do the crime doesn't mean that the punishment just should be the same thing. It it should be a one size fits all, right? It should not. And so we're really paying close attention to that. The other part of that is presuming positive intent. I think that that is a huge dignity factor that we cannot know. We can no longer walk in the door and feel like, you know, oh, I have to automatically think or feel something negative about somebody because of what I see. I need to really dig down and dig deep and presume positive intent first, always, you know. And then the other part of that is building relationships, you know, and you cannot build relationships without understanding people's story. And oftentimes we'll look at each other and we just make these assumptions, right? Right. Because that's very natural. It is. But when we get to know people's story, it's all of a sudden like, oh my gosh, we connect and this is how we connect. You know, Mm -hmm. um, you can just about find, I say several connections and just having one conversation with someone. Um, And I think that we oftentimes need to really seek that out. The other thing that we're doing is affirming differences and uniqueness. And that's that okay. and, and that should be you. celebrated. That's a human. That get, yeah, that's that a that's celebrated. a very human thing. But let me tell you what's really amazing. And you mentioned it, Dr. Nelson. It is repairing the harm. Yes. Once harm is given, once harm is put out there, we have a responsibility to repair harm. That's correct. We have to repair harm and restore the relationship. If we do not do that, then we are really setting ourselves up. Um, this is a, a framework that was developed by uh, Dr. Cobb and Dr. Crownapple, who are leading experts in equity. And um, when we looked at it, and we looked at several, right. I mean, but this was the one that we all felt really connected with who we are as a district, but also what we want to see happen. We want to honor people. We want right. to cultivate uh, every single student in our district every single employee in our district. We want to cultivate your knowledge. We want to push you and get you to really think about some things. But ultimately, what we really want you to do is be able to honor people with dignity and start there first. If we started there first, I think of so many things in our country, you know, would definitely be different. So that is my answer to that one. Dr. Gully earned her doctorate's degree about a year ago in educational leadership. So I think it's important to tap into that knowledge and education anytime that we can. We're going to do it every week with this Lessons from lessons with LaDonna. So this week's lesson is on fear, specifically the fear that mm-hmm. people in the dominant culture feel when presented with the idea of empowering minority cultures. Mm-hmm. Yes. That is a so one of the I've had several conversations about this because I think that there is this notion that um, if I validate who you are, if I am empathizing who you are, then for some reason I must be giving up something. You're not giving up anything. It's an added value. It's an added value on so many levels. And I think that uh, really helping, um, seeking to understand before seeking to be understood is really important. And we all need to take a step back first and really seek that. Let me seek to understand. You know, here's the other part of that, too. It is okay to acknowledge that we've all made mistakes because guess what? We all have made mistakes. None of us 
have been perfect at this. And it doesn't matter who we are, what we look like, what our Agreed. ethnicities are, backgrounds. We have all failed. And it's very evident, right? And so what we have to really do now is take a step back and say, you know what? I'm going to release my fear so that I can learn. I'm going to release my fear so that I can grow. I'm going to release my fear so that I can understand. I'm going to do that because I deserve it. You know, one of the things I've noticed is that, and I've said this before, is that I think that uh, oftentimes we don't understand our history. And this is one of the reasons why history keeps repeating itself, right? <laughs> it keeps repeating mm -hmm. itself because we haven't learned the lessons. And we have got, we have this really unique opportunity right now, right here, right now, to really say, you know what, I'm going to learn the lessons. I'm going to stop. You know, the pandemic that we've been in, COVID-19 has been um, a pandemic, right? That you only have those once every 100 years or so, right? So we won't have this opportunity again, at least not in my lifetime. Um, knowing that, we've got to slow down more. I think that if that has ta really taught me that. We have to slow down more. We have to pay attention more. We have to really sit down and listen. Um I am very fortunate. I just shared this with someone the other day that um, I've always been around just really, really great people, people who think, people who ponder, people who ask really hard and difficult questions of me as well as the others around me. And I, I think we have to seek that. And here's the thing. If you are comfortable in a room or in a setting, you should be concerned because your goal, if you're really trying to grow, is to be uncomfortable and be in uncomfortable rooms because those are the rooms of growth and healing. And that's a scary place to be when you're talking about fear, the fear of the unknown. And I, I was listening to you, and it brought a thought to my mind that, you know, when we feel like there's an either or, like I have to either choose to love myself or choose to love you, that's not what this is about. This, when you start talking about being a Christian, when you start talking about living by those core values that you feel are important, most likely we have the same core values. We value family. We value um, relationships. We uh, value honesty and, and integrity. That doesn't have a color. But when you start applying a color to situations, to uh, knowledge, then you're starting to say, well, I don't know if that's what I want to know. I think as a leader, as an educator, as a former building principal and now director, it is very difficult for me to say that I love all kids when I'm not willing to even appreciate and recognize their culturals, their culture and their cultural differences and look for the positives and how that adds value to my campus. When you're really talking about building a campus culture, the culture should be reflective of the people you're serving. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be a reflection of one part and ignoring the other. So when you t when that, that fear, that fear of losing power, that fear of losing identity, that's only when you shift your mind into that either or. When you, like you said, when you open your mind, when you release your fears and you allow yourself to receive mm -hmm. and learn, then you have things that you can now um, find the similarities, find those common grounds, and you'll find that we're more similar than different. Absolutely, you, you know. Do. You don't get, when you walk in the door, I don't know that you have your doctorate from SMU. They don't know that we got our doctors from SMU. They see an African-American female coming. Now, if I'm walking slowly, all right, I'm not much of a threat. If I'm walking quickly, my purse perched on my shoulders, and I got a scowl on my face, someone is already running me through a filter as, who is she coming to get at? It could be I'm just running late. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it could be I'm trying to get to the store before it closed. I'm not coming for anyone. But society has allowed stereotypes to dictate how we approach people mm -hmm. instead of letting people introduce themselves to us. So that's why I'm so excited about the LET Committee. I'm excited about the podcast and the conversations you all are having because you've introduced me to a lot of people. I've been in the district 26 years. I taught three years in Louisiana before coming. So this is year 29 for me. I'm approaching 30 years in education. I still get excited every beginning of the school year like a brand new you know, like a kid with a brand new backpack. I'm getting ready to meet some new people and do some great things. Um, but we should approach these equity issues and things that divide us and things that steal that joy of the school experience from our teachers, our students, our community. We should meet it with the same energy we do as a brand new school year. Like we should be excited Absolutely. to learn about 
the people in our community and what they have to offer. Not be afraid of it, but embrace it. Yes. Well, that's where we're going to have to leave it because I know we could go forever. Yes. You, you and I do. <laughs> Oh, we, we do. do. Oh, we all would the time. If we talk more. Come on. Yes. But we got to leave it there. Um, that's our show. Thanks for the panel of experts, our dual doctors and good friends, yes. Dr. LaDonna Gulley and Thank Dr. You for inviting me. Valerie Nelson from the Learning Center. Thanks for coming in. We appreciate it. Remember to like and follow us on social media and use the term Let MISD to track us down and feel free to interact with us that way or by using our email address, Let's Talk at MesquiteISD.org. Thanks for listening, and let's talk again next week.